So, hello everyone. Come in, find a spot. <laughs> so, after a, a very first exciting year, the DPC is back and we have a, ter a team determined to make the second year equally great as the first year. And I would like to thank my entire team and you all for helping us by giving a speaking suggestion and uh, appearing in such numerous, huge numbers. And today we kick off with a perfect start for this second year. I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Richard James from the University of Minnesota. Professor James is highly decorated and well known in his field, which is the field of phase transitions. And already for many years he has been working to understand these materials both from a theoretical and an experimental point of view. With years of experience in mathematical models, he continues to search for new materials with a wide variety of properties, and I am sure that during his talk, he will present us a few of such new materials. Now, I could continue and cite part of his uh, impressive resume, uh, his many very high impact uh, articles, and mention a few of his numerous awards, like the Alexander von Dolbert Senior Research Award, the William Prager Medal, and the Kreuter Medal. We need a language specialty to read all those names. But I, instead, I think it will be much more interesting to hear the man talk about his own research. So, with a title as uh, New Materials Real and Imagined, you've captured my imagination already. <laughs> so, the floor is yours. And also to the other Nick for inviting me to uh, the ease on that conference, which is taking place here now. So, oops, we're going to do one, maybe two. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, very good. So, um, <coughs> so this is a kind of general talk, and uh, please interrupt me if something is not clear. But uh, I'm going to talk about many different things. Uh, and I hope it uh, fits the spirit of this interesting seminar that uh, you have organized by the postdocs. So um, <clears throat> I'll talk about um, the discovery of materials. And as Nick was saying, I use mathematical theory to discover materials, which is quite an unusual thing to do. And the mathematical theory is, is designed to, to, um, to inform the synthesis of the materials. You know, what do you do to make a better material? And we try to use uh, some mathematical ideas to, 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 to inform that decision. And uh, it can be quite successful if you think this way. Um, so the, the subject area is reversible phase transformations, or at least I'll start with these. And then since Nick asked me to really kind of look to the future, I'll also begin with some more imagined materials or some suggestions about how to search for some interesting classes of new materials that don't really have uh, some counterpart today. So, but I'll start with uh, reversible phase transformations in crystalline materials. And uh, there's a lot going on in this field, and that's, uh, I guess, the, it's really this ESOMAT meeting, which is here, is a, is a nice representation of, of that current research. Um, and it's somehow it's blossoming, in my view, in, in, in these past few years. So, we can expect to see many interesting things in the near future, I would say. Uh, there was a long period where many, you know, many things were done, were interesting things, but somehow the field got started with two great discoveries, one in 1952, a theoretical discovery, which was called the crystallographic theory of Martensite, and the discovery of this nickel-titanium-shaped memory alloy, which actually has a very amusing um, description in this chemical educator. Uh, if you want to read about the, the accidental discovery of material, this is the uh, perfect example. And that's dominated a lot of research. But um, these days, people are looking at a much wider variety of materials, um, including multiferroic materials. That's one of the interesting area, interest, most interesting areas is this, this way of, of producing multiferroic materials by using phase transformations. So I'll talk about that. So, a lot of this, th these developments concern the reversibility of phase transformation. So it's driven by the fact that sometimes you can get a phase transformation to occur once in a solid crystalline material, but that's all. And the kind of classic example is this. This is the pure element tin. Uh, you 
may have seen this before, but this is simply cooling tin to about minus 15 C, and, um, and you have a phase transformation. It's actually a cubic to tetragonal phase transformation. And uh, this is what happens to the material. You, you do it once. Um, it's, there's a famous story about uh, tin this, and this phase transformation, it, and it's probably a myth. But the, the story is that this phase transformation contributed to the defeat of Napoleon in Russia. Do you know this story? So the point is that the soldiers wore buttons made of tin, and then they, they went into Russia, and the temperature went down to minus 10, minus 15 C, and the buttons disintegrated, and of course the coats flew open, and this was, uh, this was the defeat of but of course, people in material science know this is, a, this is a myth because almost any small amount of another element you add to tin takes the space transformation down to very low temperatures. So, it's just a myth. But anyway, the general type of phase transformation I'll, di I'll discuss is really one of the most simple kind. It's phase transformation from one crystalline structure to another. This is a very simple example where you have a cubic, phase under cubic type structure. In which, uh, in which it elongates along one of the 100 planes, 100 directions. And then, of course, by symmetry, it could elongate about any one of those directions. And so you get three possible variants of the low temperature phase. In fact, they're called variants. This phase is called martensite. Often, this the case phase is called austenite. It's not always used those names. depends on which field you're in. Uh, but I'll use that terminology. And there's some temperature theta C where the transformation occurs, but it, but it doesn't occur at, uh, at one temperature. And this is um, one of the ways in which we quantify the reversibility of phase transformations. So that's, there's the possibility of going back and forth between this variant and this variant. That's done in some experiment here, and you, you see that this is some measure, you do it by stress. This is some measure of the stress. This is the fraction of this variant versus this one. And so you, you, you transform abruptly here. And then that when you return the stress, you transform abruptly back. I'll show you how this experiment in a little bit more detail is done. Or you can, you can do the phase transformation between the cubic phase and, the, and, this, and this tetragonal <laughs> phase um, by changing temperature. And again, um, if you're cooling, this is percent of the Martin side versus temperature. If you're cooling, you begin to transform here, and you finish transforming there, and you, uh, but the other way, you don't, you don't transform here, you transform at this higher temperature, first transform to the austenite, and then you finish the austenite transformation here. This, as I said, this phase is often called austenite. And people fit that, that parallelogram uh, fit that curve with a power parallelogram and, and therefore define those four temperatures and they characterize the hysteresis by this. So instead of, instead of you know, looking at the material fall apart, if the material does not fall apart, this is a way of quantifying the reversibility of the phase transformation. So <clears throat> it's an interesting thing in, in also in magnetism and it, it, it's also equally interesting in magnetism, but I'll talk about phase transformations to quantify what, you know, or to, to understand what causes hysteresis, okay? And some of the new materials I'll talk about are, are related to an understanding of what causes hysteresis. So let me begin, though, by telling you what are the accepted ideas for what causes hysteresis. So one of the ideas is that when you have a phase transformation, you have an interface that separates the two phases, and it uh, so it moves through the material, converting one phase to the other, there are, there are inevitably non-transforming defects in the material, and this interface comes up against this defect. It requires an additional lowering of the free energy of the, of the new phase to, um, to cause this to break through the defect. This happens both ways through the phase transformation, and therefore this is responsible for hysteresis. So many people would, would think this is an important aspect, and even in this ESOMAC conference, we have interesting talks about this aspect. Another aspect, which is not completely unrelated to this one, but to, is also a kind of famous under, understanding of hysteresis, is, has to do with thermal activation. And uh, I like to explain it this way. You, you imagine the potential energy of your system. So if you have a, a piece of material, it's, it's in, in its great detail, 
it's the potential energy as a function of all the atomic positions. Okay, so, so this, that's why I said 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd axes down here. So of course, no one really understands this graph, um, but, but people believe it's a very wiggly graph like this. Um, they believe that the Martin site is associated with very deep wells. And, and the state of, you can imagine describing, and you do describe the state of the system in its great detail by, by a point on this surface. Okay. Now, of course, this point is not stationary. It's a little bit like my pointer. The point is moving around, and the motion of that point is really governed by the equations of molecular dynamics. Right? And, and if, you, if you raise the temperature, you increase the thermal motion, and, and this, uh, this point go, goes over here, and maybe at the higher temperature, it's, it finds its way out of that deep well, and that's the phase transformation, and it sits out here. In fact, people believe that, that the average position of that dot is maybe not even in a well, maybe even in a local maximum. And that's, that's the, the concept of that is that the austenite would be stabilized by entropic effects. So, in any case, there's some average position, and now you cool the material. You take heat out of the material, so you decrease the thermal motion, and it has to find its way into one of those, one of those deep wells. Well, as you can imagine from the picture, it could, be, it could be a lot harder to find one of those deep wells than it is to find your way out of one of those deep wells, and therefore the temperatures at which these occur could be different, and that's hysteresis. So that's the thermally activated idea of hysteresis, and uh, as I said, these are not completely separate. And one of the interesting things recently is, is the realization that, that neither of these ideas is the right idea <laughs> for hysteresis and phase transformations. And so I would like to describe mainly a third idea. So first I, first I want to tell you a little bit about, a little bit more about hysteresis. So, um, um, I see that's a little bit messed up there. Okay, anyway, there's, there's that, as I said, there was, there was, there was an example of, of transforming one variant of martensite to the other. So this was, and if, in fact, this case, it's an orthorhombic crystal. And this, this dark red region is one variant of the martensite, and this light red region is another variant. And there's only two variants represented in the pictures. So it's a, it's, a, it's a microstructure consisting of exactly two variants of martensite. And, um, and this was, if you, if, you, if you play around with the stress in these two axes, you can, you can make it transform. That's how the stress was obtained, by, by, by cycling the stress. And it's a biaxial stress in a particular way. It's not important. But, the, but and, and then this graph was obtained by taking, by taking this window and digitizing it and finding the area fraction, which turns out to be the volume fraction, because these interfaces are perpendicular to them specimen and, and, and making this graph. So that what you see is that the, and, and there's different dots corresponds to different measurements, and so you see that on, on this graph are re represented dots in which a certain loading program was done in stress phase, but the period was changed. So this was changed by two orders of magnitude from a thousand seconds to ten seconds, and you can see that you get the same loop. Okay? That's so-called rate-independent hysteresis, and that's very typical kind of hysteresis in phase transformations. We do have rate effects if we, if particularly in the, in the case of, um, if we go back to here, in the case of the transforming between one phase and another, this can be slightly changed by, by rate, by doing different rates, but it does not shrink to zero when you make the rate go to zero. So hysteresis in phase transformations is not caused by some kind of viscosity like in, like in fluid mechanics or, or you know, viscoelastic or viscous effect is not the right effect for phase transformations. So, okay, so now I want to tell you a little bit about this other, this other possible effect. And to do that, I need to introduce somebody who's very little mathematics here, even though that we, we use a lot in our, in our understanding of these phase transformations, but I, I will introduce some notation. So here's a phase transformation. This, in this case, I chose a cubic to orthorhombic phase transformation. And um, so this cube undergoes a distortion, uh, a linear transformation to the, to the um, orthorhombic phase. So it's, in this case, it's a, it's, it's a shortening 
on this vertical axis. And the top face, which is a square here, becomes a rhombus here. And there are three, if you, if you choose units so these, these edges are one, there are three parameters here, alpha, beta, and gamma. And this, this U1 is the matrix of the linear transformation in the cubic basis that takes this to this. So that's the matrix which describes the linear transformation. That's the transformation matrix or transformation stretch matrix. And I'll be talking about this matrix. So different phase transformations, we measure those matrices by measuring, measuring the crystal structures and lattice parameters by x-ray measurements of those two phases. And um, actually, alpha, beta, and gamma are eigenvalues of that matrix, but I need the ordered eigenvalues. So I'll rename them lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, conventional. And lambda 2 is going to play a special role. It's the middle eigenvalue of this matrix. Actually, this is a very simple phase transformation, and, and in most cases, we deal with much more complex cases, much more complex lattices than that. And these kind, of, in that case, these kind of phase transformations occur in the following way. So there might be a large number of, of, of Bravé lattices, simple lattices determined by three linearly independent vectors. And during one of these phase transformations, each one of those undergoes exactly the same linear transformation. So if that didn't happen, you would destroy periodicity. But the different lattices can displace relative to each other. That's called shuffling. And so that's the typical picture of a phase transformation in a complex lattice. And in that case, we identify this transformation stretch matrix with the linear transformation of any one of those lattices. They're all the same. OK, now I want to talk about what do we see when we put a material, a very simple experiment, uh, we put it under the optical microscope and we lower the temperature. This is what we almost always see. And that's, um, that's it's a bit surprising how universal this is. Now, of course, we, we, often, we often see very complex microstructures. So this would be what we would see at the finest level, at least maybe not the, maybe not the error, maybe not the, the scale bar the same, but but um, the structure the same. And uh, so it's very, very, quite a universal uh, structure seen in phase transformations, these kind of crystal to crystal phase transformations. And let me explain. There's a theory for this, and it goes back to that uh, 1952 paper I, I mentioned earlier. Uh, and that actually was a, quite a milestone in the, in, in the understanding of, of phase transformations because if you look at that interface, it looks beautifully crystallographic, right? So now, if you measure the normal to that interface, of course, you, to measure the normal, you have to look at it on two different surfaces, but you can do that. And you can measure in three dimensions the normal to that interface. And you express the normal in the cubic basis, the crystallographic basis of the austenite. Now, everybody would have believed that the, 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 the components of that normal would be small integers. That's a rational plane. So this, they would think that this was crystallographic, should be rational. The, the, when they measured, it wasn't. Okay? So this, this, this plane is, has somehow nothing to do with the crystallography. It does have something to do, but it's certainly not directly related to the crystallography of the material. So I won't tell you the theory, but the, the physical understanding of this interface, and there is a quantitative theory, but the physical understanding is the following, is that Okay, the first guess would be you take austenite and over here you put a single variant of the martensite. That's in fact one of these bands. So you fill the region instead of this structure, one of those bands. And you would find that you, in order to, to fit that together with the austenite through a transition layer, you would, you would find that there would be an enormous amount of energy in that transition layer, enormous amount of stress. So somehow the phases don't fit together. And um, so another possibility would be to, to finally layer two variants of martensite. Now, when you fire, finally layer two variants of martensite, you get, you get many more possibilities for shape when it, when it deforms. You, know, you can picture a zigzag like a fan. You, know, you get many possibilities of shape by layering two variants. And, and it turns out that if you layer them in exactly the right volume function, and you put this interface in exactly the right way, then you can make a very low energy transition layer between the phases. So in fact, there's even a theorem that says that, that if, you, if you take the ideal shape changes 
you make this interface with just the right normal, which turns out to be irrational, then you can drive, by making these twins finer and finer, you can drive the energy, elastic energy in this transition layer to zero. Okay? And then you take that calculation, you prepare with the experiment. Very rigid calculation. You, you get, if you give me this so-called twin system, the two variants, and the type of the way they're arranged, um, then I just get four possible normals to this interface, and I get two possible volume fractions. Very rigid calculation. Now, there's one more piece of information, and that is that that explanation could not be exactly correct, because it would suggest that that if I want to reduce the, the energy in this layer, I just keep making these, these twins finer and finer and finer and finer. And of course, they have a certain scale. And that's understood as well. And the, the explanation is the following. It's that, it's that if you, um, it is that there's a tiny interfacial energy, kind of like a surface tension on the boundaries of those bands. So if you add more and more bands, you add more and more interfacial energy. Um, you drive the, the elastic energy to zero. Of course, if you made them very coarse, the, you wouldn't have much interfacial energy, but you'd have a large elastic energy. And what this picture represents is the compromise between those two. Okay? So it's a compromise between interfacial energy on these bands and elastic energy in this transition layer. So that suggests a third possible explanation for hysteresis, which is the following. So you, you start with a material with all austenite, okay, so it's completely the cubic phase, and you start cooling it. Now, we know that there are little bits of martensite, and they might look like this in an idealized form, that, that are waiting to grow and to form these interfaces. Um, but as I just mentioned, there's, there's so there's, by, by, by having these yellow and orange bands in here, I lower, imagine that we're below the transition temperature. So the free energy of these bands here is less than the free energy of the austenite. So I'm reducing the energy, but then I'm forced to accept the energy on these, in these transition layers. Okay, and that's positive energy. And that dominates, in fact, at small scales. So when this is a very thin needle. So in fact, as, as soon as you have the energy lowering bulk material, you're forced to take energy raising transition layer and interfacial layer. So that's, that creates an energy barrier, and that could be the reason for hysteresis. So I want to explore that. So transformation is delayed because the additional bulk and interfacial energy that must be present merely because the two faces are next to each other has to be overcome by a further lowering of the free energy of the stable face. So that's, that's um, you know, you could study this, and, and we began to study this, but we, we realized, um, also with, with a number of collaborators, that, that, um, that um, there's an experimental way to, to look at this, this effect of, this, of, of compatibility on hysteresis. And you can do it the following way. You, you recognize, first of all, so there's that linear transformation between the phases. And remember, it has three eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And you, you realize that there's a little mathematical lemma which says that don't worry about the notation. It says that if the middle eigenvalue of this matrix is 1, then the two phases are perfectly compatible. This is the compatibility equation. And again, I won't explain the details, but you can see in the pictures that if the middle eigenvalue of this matrix is 1, you can have a perfect interface. So this is, this is the austenite. This underwent the distortion. It's also been rotated a little bit. But you can rotate it a little bit such that it fits perfectly on the austenite. You don't need the twin. You don't need the second variant. You don't need the transition layer. You don't need the interfacial energy. So all that barrier is, is now gone if lambda 2 is 1. Okay? Now, so how do you make lambda 2 1? Well, everything in sight, including this matrix and its middle eigenvalue, depends on the composition of the material. So you, 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 you you start with the material, and you, you measure its lattice parameters with x-ray measurements, and you compute lambda 2. And you see it's not 1. No material has it 1. And then you make another material, and you do x-ray measurements, and you measure its lattice parameters, and you compute lambda 1 again. Maybe it's a bit closer to 1, maybe it's a bit further from 1. And as you can imagine, you can systematically 
change the composition to make it close to one. So um, basically that's the picture which goes with that. And uh, if, if that barrier is responsible for hysteresis, you should see a lowering of the hysteresis of phase transformations. So we, uh, we, we did it and uh, other people did it and combinatorial synthesis experts did it and, um, and it, the re results are truly remarkable. And here's, here's one of the graphs. This is um, in a, a, a whole family of alloys with um, nickel and titanium and various third elements. And this is a, so each one, each dot is a, a, has a different composition. And this is a measurement of the width of that hysteresis loop that I showed earlier. And of course, each one has a different composition. I couldn't plot that versus composition, but now I've replotted it versus the middle eigenvalue. And you can see there's a very, very dramatic drop in fact, a very sharp drop of hysteresis versus this middle eigenvalue. And somehow, oh, I didn't, I didn't, okay, I have a close up this. There's, there's alloys down here with, with one and two degrees um, thermal hysteresis, which were not known, uh, or largely not known, certainly among uh, uh, big first order phase transformations before this. So, of course, all that was done, and, and uh, but we didn't. We didn't know if the theoretical explanation had anything to do with this graph because we had never seen one of these interfaces. So of course we come to Antwerp, and uh, um, this is some some nice work from from Remy Delgil, who is a former student of this department, and he managed to in a material which was near satisfying lambda two equals one. I'll talk about that in a minute. He used to think this was the material at lambda two equals one. And it had about six degrees hysteresis. And um, um, in fact, this was known before the graph I showed you before, and it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, so he measured the normal, to, that's the interface between the two phases. He saw many of those perfect interfaces. And uh, he measured the normal, it turns out that's the end. Don't worry about the formulas, but anyway, there's a, and there's a, he measured this lattice rotation, that's the angle in this matrix Q. Anyway, don't worry about details, but the point is that uh, there was a very nice agreement for, of, of all the interfaces that he could see, and the interfaces expected when lambda 2 is 1. In other words, theoretically, they would be the, these interfaces were the ones he was observing. Okay, so um, here's an interesting graph. Now you, so now there's a way to make materials with very low hysteresis, and I'll tell you about, a bit more about some of those materials. Um, this is a graph, now I've replotted history, history, so in all those alloys here, we knew all three of the eigenvalues, and that allows us to calculate the, the, the determinant of this matrix U, this transformation stretch matrix, which is the volume ratio of the faces. So if anybody would, th if people would think, if, if there's anything that should affect the hysteresis or produce an energy barrier, it's if the new phase is growing in a volume in the wrong volume, right? A volume which is too big or too small to fit it, right? That's exactly happens if, if this determinant U is not one. So determinant U is one means there's perfect volume conservation of the two of the phase transformation. But now you plot hysteresis and you see that this is in fact old data before these very low alloys. But anyway, this is you see that some of the alloys with the lowest hysteresis and the highest hysteresis. Um, have the determinant one, have no volume change. So it seems that there's no, it's quite surprising there's no correlation with the volume change. Okay, so, so you have to explain, first of all, I have to explain, people made huge numbers of these nickel, titanium, copper, and so forth, even palladium, nickel, titanium, copper, palladium, and various other elements um, before these results. So how could they possibly miss this, this, these, the lambda two equals one materials. The point is that, that that graph is very, very sharp. So here's an example. So here's a bunch of alloys with, with uh, different amounts of palladium. And this is, this is each one is, is <coughs> its hysteresis is plotted, plotted versus lambda two. And there's the old alloy we used to think was the lowest PD11. And now you go in this box and now you start doing compositional changes where you change the amount of palladium by quarter percent increments, and you find that, in fact, wow, it's, doesn't, it's not that, but it, you can go down to, in fact, two degrees in a bulk material. And so with, 
with very careful compositional changes, it, it does actually matter. And you can get, uh, typically in bulk material, we can get one and two degrees if we do those very, very precise uh, compositional changes. So that's why it was missed uh, previously. Okay. So um, I'll tell you a little bit more about those materials and some of their applications. But I want to first talk about um, another development which is very closely related. So um, I mentioned that this was the microstructure we see at phase transformation. I mentioned there was a theory for it. And there's the, the four solutions I mentioned. I mentioned the calculation was quite rigid. And there's the four solutions. They correspond to the two volume fractions. In fact, they were performed F and 1 minus F. Um, and so, so as I said, it's quite rigid calculation. There's four different normals to the austenite martin side interface. Um, um, but if you look in this theory, you see there's a kind of degeneracy. So, the, the, you know, so of course, if, if you tune lambda two to one, you, those, those four <coughs> solutions become these four solutions. Again, there's a lot of rigidity. I mean, in the sense that, the, the, that this, this variant Martin site only participates in these two solutions. So there's really not many ways you can arrange this. And people would believe that the, the number of arrangements is also important, as well as the stress at the interface. So as I say, there's a, there was a, there's a degeneracy in this, in this theory that describes this interface. And the degeneracy occurs when these mathematical conditions are satisfied. So first, you have to satisfy lambda 2 equals 1. And then you have to satisfy a second condition Again, it's just geometry. It's a condition on the lattice parameters of the material. You have to satisfy an inequality. And these conditions are called the cofactor conditions. So this is quite recent. And, 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 and if you satisfy those conditions, you can not just have four solutions like those or like those, depending on what the lambda 2 or In this case, lambda 2 might be 1. So, But you can continuously vary the volume fraction. As you're varying this volume fraction, this is fitting very nicely with, with a very small transition layer. I mean, I really exaggerated the strains here so you could see. But uh, there's a very small transition layer in each case, vanishingly small transition layer, you might say. And uh, of course, there's the end states which correspond to the case lambda 2 equals 1. So there's a lot of flexibility in the fitting together of this microstructure. So you, if you want to think like a jigsaw puzzle is sitting on the table, and you imagine you, you change the shape of the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Of course, it buckles on a plane. Right? Now, the point is that if the, if the interfaces are, are right and the shape changes are just right, everything still fits together. You know, that's, what's, that's what's happening under conditions like this. And the, there's different cases with different twin systems. Um, so this is, this is satisfying these conditions for different uh, choices of the variants of Martin site. There's some very interesting cases where the, these are parallel to the austenite martin set interface. Um, this is for type 1 twins. Actually, in this case, in this case, you can, in, in also in this case, um, you can completely remove the transition layer. So this is a case where everything is fitting together and, and there's no transition layer. There, there's zero elastic energy in all those pictures. Um, and then when you see that, you realize you can actually make curved interfaces so if you satisfy these particular conditions on lattice parameters, you have tremendous flexibility in the way the two phases can fit together. And again, these are nucleation mechanisms. This is nucleation of the carbon site in the austenite on a corner. This is nucleation. This is, this is two Martin site variants, a blue and a green one. And it's nucleation on a band. Again, these are zero energy methods. Here's something even more complex if you satisfy it for two different twin systems. Again, a, a kind of jigsaw puzzle type situation that you can move in. So um, very recently, um, two alloy systems have been discovered which satisfy those conditions. We, our, our paper was first, actually, but it was, this is the real spectacular result. Anyway, um, uh, it's, uh, we systematically changed the composition to satisfy those conditions. In fact, this alloy was discovered more by accident. So uh, I'll, tell you, and I'll tell you both of, about both of them. They're both quite interesting. Um, now we, we started with this, this understanding. We started with some materials where lambda 2 was already near 1. And then we tried to satisfy the cofactor conditions. And 
we saw that these were good starting points. Actually, VO2 is also an extremely good starting point that has not very difficult to make quality VO2, but it's an extremely good starting point that hasn't been done. But anyway, um, those, are, those are two materials. And I'll tell you about, first about zinc, um, zinc uh, 45 gold 30 copper 25. That's this, this. That's our set of alloys, and that's we recognized um, that this was satisfying the cofactor conditions. This one very closely, and this is a measurement in calorimetry of the size of the hysteresis. There's a particular way of doing this that I won't describe, but anyway, this this particular measurement has 0.2 c hysteresis. So that's that's really amazing for a first order phase transformation. Six percent strain. This is a big first order phase. Transformation. So, um, and I'll, I'll show you a little, it's, it's quite nice to look at, because usually in phase transformations, when you, when you change the temperature, cycle it back and forth through the phase transformation, you get the same picture going forward and backward, and same picture from cycle to cycle. That's very typical in phase transformations. Usually, um, usually thought to be mediated by defects and so forth. This is a single grain in a, in a polycrystal, and it's, and now I'm going to be changing the temperature by heating it from below. And in this experiment, the heating is done the same each time. So you can see, I mean, you may not be familiar with these, these phase transformations, but um, oh, that wasn't too good. Where is it right there? Um, but you, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar a bit with these, you, you would see you would see lots of unusual things in this picture. First of all, if you look carefully, you can see some curved interfaces. So it's kind of what you would expect. Um, every picture is different. Uh, so that's heating and cooling. That's the martensite phase. That's the austenite phase. The different colors here correspond to the different variants of martensite. And this material has 12 variants of martensite. So, um, Quite unusual um, microstructure and quite unusual uh, dynamics for a, for a phase transformation. Um, again, many things I could tell you about this picture is these pictures which are completely different from what they expect. And so it seems that there's quite a quite a strong effect on, um, of satisfying these cofactor conditions on the behavior of the material. Now we, 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 we thought it's, it's, well we saw that it had low hysteresis. We said, what about the reversibility with cycling? So we, we put it in a cycling machine, like this kind of machine, and we cycled it. Of course, um, I'm a theoretician, so my lab can't do very sophisticated things. So we did 20,000 cycles. We saw that the transformation temperature was very steady. It, all the properties, we measured the latent heat, you know, all the typical properties of phase transformation. At least to 20,000, they're very very steady. But the most interesting thing is you, instead of doing gold 30, whatever, you do gold 28 or gold 27. It's a completely different alloy. I mean, so it really depends on satisfying these kind of conditions very closely. The, the deviations from somehow perfect geometry really matter a tremendous amount. But that, now, as I said, this has been a very recent, a, a recent development, which is, which is, which is in this area, you know, I consider it uh, spectacular. This is a material. So this is undergoing a big first order phase transformation. Uh, it's undergoing the full transformation, although the strain is not as big as, is not so big. But anyway, it's full transformation. And um, and and this this graph. So this black graph is the first cycle, and this red graph is cycle 10 million. And this is very unusual in phase transformation. So that's a sort of perfect, revis nearly perfect reversibility after 10 million cycles. So you really can contrast that with the behavior of tin at the beginning of the lecture. And not only that, look at the, the peak stress here is 400 megapascals. That's a lot of stress. You know, that's the that's the typical yield stress in the, in the steel that holds up this building. So it's really a lot of stress each cycle, and it's in tension. So that's uh, you know, homogeneous tension. So that's really quite a spectacular, in my view, quite a spectacular result. So we, we now, maybe now we understand how to make phase transformations reversible, and uh, I'm not sure, but uh, seems to be some evidence for that. 
and uh, could be many interesting things to do. So here's one of the interesting things to do. Um, it is um, to work with Heusler alloys. This, this is a, in a Heusler system. Heusler, Heusler alloys have chemical composition A2BC. The original Heusler alloys had, had the property that if neither, none of A, B, or C are ferromagnetic as in the periodic table, then you make A2BC and it's ferromagnetic. So they have a great propensity towards ferromagnetism. Even if you go off stoichiometric, this is, this is maybe based on um, nickel 2 manganese 10, and it's even pretty far from stoichiometric, but still. So we managed by changing composition to get lambda 2 not, not that close to 1, but it, it anyway had about 6 degrees hysteresis. That's calorimetry. But this is quite interesting material because the martensite phase is, is non-magnetic. And um, by the way, this class of alloys and the, the, in, you know, the first measurements were done by actually people also visiting this ESAMET conference, in particular a guy, Professor Kainuma from Japan. And uh, this is a related alloy. But this is a really spectacular one because the, the martensite phase is non-magnetic. You go through the phase transformation and it becomes a magnet. But not only that, it's, this is, you probably don't know this unit, but it's 1,200 EMU per centimeter cube. That's a really strong magnet. Almost the strength of iron at that temperature. And it has very interesting magnetic behavior that I, I won't go into, but uh, uh, there's a tiny bit of ferromagnetism in the Martin site, but it's actually anti-ferromagnetic, and uh, I won't go into those details. But the fun thing is, to, this is my students did this, is they took a piece of that material and they stuck it on a copper finger, and they heated the finger. And then they happened to put a permanent magnet eight centimeters away or so, and then this is what they saw. It's a bit silly, but <laughs> somebody told me that I should, I should uh, turn this graph you know, 90 degrees so, so that the, the magnet lifts the you know, lifts the uh, material, and then I have an example of energy conversion, the conversion of, of, of heat to kinetic energy in that case. But actually, there's a more serious uh, way to think about energy conversion. It's an interesting thing to do with phase transformations. It's this way. So you take a piece of that material, you put it on top of a permanent magnet, and you you put a coil around it. And now you now you just heat it up. So this goes through the phase transformation, and I know you're physics students, so you know Maxwell's equations at some level, so I, I explain this with Maxwell's equations. So. Now, this suddenly magnetizes. So we, we use this deep um, dipolar relationship, D equals H plus M or 4 pi M, and when it suddenly magnetizes, dM dt is very large. So now, so somehow dM dt is partitioned between dB dt and dH dt. And how much goes into dBdt and how much goes into dHdt, that's known. The, the subject of that is called micromagnetics. And it depends on the shape. Um, and it's, so it's quite interesting in itself. So what we do is we make the shape and other properties. So a big dMdt gives you a big dBdt. And then dBdt is proportional to curl E. That means you drive a current in the coil. So that's an energy conversion device in which um, maybe small temperature differences can be used to, to, to create electricity, and there's no electrical generator. The material does it. So it's quite interesting, and we studied this, uh, also the thermodynamics, this, and it's not at the point where, where, where it's competitive quite yet, but it's certainly close. It's certainly the, um, with slightly better materials than we have now, it uh, beats thermoelectric materials, and that's a big milestone for it for this kind of method. But it's one of the few methods that will convert heat to electricity at small temperature difference. So we also think about that in terms of, this is, you know, you can imagine, here's, a, here's a sol the solar thermal plant in the south of Spain. In fact, uh, you may recognize this character right there. Um, and actually, that's me. And if you really, if it was a good picture, you would recognize this character. And you would also see that my, my knuckles are completely white because I'm afraid of heights. And we're, st <laughs> we're standing right there, and already this is hugely far off the ground. And of course, the, the huge black tank that's 
that's doing energy conversion by steam methods, classical thing, you know, with, this, with the focused rays of the sun on the top of this tower is quite large. So, you know, one possibility is instead of focusing all those mirrors and using this classical method of energy conversion, you could have one of these materials at the focal point of each mirror. It could be much more distributed, much smaller, and perhaps this could be a good way of doing energy conversion. You can also think of the Arctic and the kind of temperature differences that, that you see there. So these are a bit dreams, but uh, that's what I was asked to do with this talk. So. <laughs> um, now, you, when you realize that, you realize that phase transformations could be used in a lot of ways for energy conversion. Not only, I used magnetism, you could also use for electricity. Instead of using coils, you could use capacitors, you know, you, so there's quite, quite a lot of uh, possibilities. Many of these are not even demonstrated yet, but uh, use of phase transformations. And more generally, you know, what, what are we doing? We're using the fact that, that a phase transformation has a change of lattice plane. So that was what the first part of my talk was all about tuning those lattice parameters. But the change of lattice parameters can have another effect because a lot of these collective properties like ferromagnetism and ferroelectricity and all these properties, they're sensitive to the lattice parameters. So if you have a phase transformation with a change of lattice parameters, you can imagine instead of going from, non, from, from anti ferromagnetic to strong ferromagnetic, you can have many pairs of properties that could change at a phase transformation. Again, uh, in particular of interest, I think, are the optical properties. There's also possible applications in um, microelectronics and so forth. So almost everything here is undemonstrated, and uh, it's a great, I think, uh, area for new materials in phase transformations. So, okay, am I, am I running out of time? Oh, five minutes, right? <laughs> so, so do you, do you, do you okay. Because okay, I, I could stop here, right? and maybe it's the best thing because uh, that's what you asked me to do. <laughs> so okay, I had some other interesting materials which uh, are kind of biological, but uh, okay. And anyway, that's uh, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Yeah, so that's this, you know, the, there's, you, you, one would have to um, put error bars, which is quite difficult on those, um, you know, we, I, I guess I showed this case where we, we, we tuned very carefully to get two degrees hysteresis, and then for the second set of samples, we got three degrees hysteresis, so, you know, that's, one has to be careful, and, and there are error bars there, but it's a very sharp, um, it's, I, I would consider it a very sharp, uh, graph. And, and it also, you know, another aspect of your question is, is, is it a universal graph? Because, of course, they're all different alloys. Now, all those alloys had similar crystallography. So they, they were all cubic to orthorhombic phase transformations. Um, we've seen other, you know, other transformations fit quite similar graphs, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say the graph is universal in that sense. So there could be, yeah. But the truth is, you, 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 and this is why people missed it previously, is you have to be very close in composition to lambda 2 plus 1 to, to see the dramatic drop in hysteresis. But it seems to be that in many different material systems, this is possible. So that's, the, yeah. Did they also miss it theoretically? The, what, what's that? They missed it experimentally. Yeah, they missed it theoretically too. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. People were, were not thinking this. In a way, it's a simpler explanation than the old explanation. It's, it's uh, just about the fitting together of phases and the transition layers, and these create a barrier. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Can you say a few words on on the, the way that uh, you look for the different <coughs> compositions? 
Because now it looks like I mean, just making you well, like the, I mean, like the high treatment work that was done. Yeah, so um, that was very important because, um, yeah, so we did, we did some of those alloys on that graph, which is, I did, we did them exactly the way I described. Make an alloy, do x-ray measurements, measure lambda 2, take it to the x-ray machine, measure lambda 2, and then, and then painstakingly make lambda 2 equals 1. The, the combinatorial synthesis people, like um, in, the people in Botham, and Ichiro Takeuchi as well. Um, they, they have automatic methods for um, making films with graded compositions. And they can accurately, um, pretty accurately, tell you the composition. So they can, they, can, um, they, can, they can give you a ternary phase diagram of their film, where, where every, every point on the film has a quite, quite accurately determined composition. Then they can take that film to the synchrotron. And then they can do, and of course, x-ray measurements on films where you're looking for great accuracy is not so easy. So they, they really worked on those methods and they worked very hard to get those measurements. So then they did x-ray measurements on each little dice top square of those films and assigned lattice parameters uh, then as a function of composition from the lattice parameters they measured lambda 2. So that's, that, that was a, that experimentally that was a, a major, triumph in a way, and it shows the power of, of combi methods in a certain way, yeah. yeah. Of course, they also have, those combi people also have characterization for magnetic <coughs> properties, for optical properties, so that can also be interesting for this, uh, looking for these various combinations of properties of phase transformations, yeah. and, and how many PhD students did Custom <laughs> you mean here or in Antwerp? <laughs> uh, no, I mean it's, uh, it really was very few people, and, um, and people were um, so. Um, the, there, there was one postdoc, uh, VJ Shrivasada, who really did a lot of the basic arc mounting. Now, of course, the, the um, different combi studies were also PhD theses. At least part. I'm not sure they were full PhD theses. It wasn't so many people. It wasn't uh, huge. It wasn't like a high energy physics, you know, huge group of people. It was a very, fa fairly small group, and uh, and the students were very highly motivated because they could measure some spectacularly low hysteresis. You know, and they realized that there's a way to get there, maybe you know, without. So yeah. How are the first principle calculations or the accurate enough to... Okay, that's a very good question, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit on Friday at ESOMAP, too. Um, it's, it's potentially a very useful tool. Um, it, hasn't been, it hasn't been as useful as it, as it, as it can be because of accuracy. You know? So um, determination um, of, you know, the determination of lattice parameters of phases are not, um, really not anywhere near accurate enough for those kind of um, studies of lambda 2. Um, but trends can be very useful. Um, and so, so I think that, in my, my feeling is first principles calculations will be more useful in the future. Behind this is our, our you know, free energy functions for the materials and, and you know, determination of those free energy functions. In principle, could, could be much more automated, say, by, by the use of first principles methods. But I think it's been hampered by the complexity of the free energy <coughs> functions, and also been hampered by um, the accuracy, as you said. For example, nickel type, binary nickel titanium, the, the stable, the, the t equals zero stable phase in all implementations of density functional theory is not predicted correctly. So that's a kind of major, major, major discrepancy that we don't know how to fix, you know, yeah, so, yeah. So if you apply an external uh, magnetic field, then yes. your hysteresis is also depending on that field. Uh, That's right. Is. Now, so, so the, 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 and this, this is something I didn't go into, so, so of course, the, the, the first thing that happens when you apply a, an external field is the transformation temperature shifts. And in fact, that's very important to the energy conversion demonstration. I didn't go into the mechanics of the energy conversion demonstration. If you have, if you, if you have a material that, um, 
that you just cycle back and forth through the phase transformation. And the temperature at which you transform on heating is the same as the one you, on cooling, say. Then um, you won't get any work, you, you won't get any electricity out of this stuff. It, it really requires, the, the, the thermodynamics requires, if you look at the temperature entropy diagram, requires a different transformation temperature on heating and on cooling. And you do that by actually uh, having an applied field. So the, the applied field plays a very important role. Um, there was a whole story about that, but uh, um, but you were I think you may have been asking also about the you know hysteresis that you get when you field induce a transformation. So, so I think if, if you you want to converse uh, your yeah. uh, your temperature uh, field. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering does is it the most efficient? Is, is it with the material with no hysteresis? Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. The, the main yes. loss, the main loss for an energy conversion device is the hysteresis. So, yeah, so, so lowering the hysteresis is critically important, especially if you're dealing with these small temperature differences. So when you, when you, when you run a heat engine like this with a small temperature difference, as I say, you, you have to do an arrangement. I could tell you more about this, but you have to do an arrangement where you, where the, um, Transformation temperature on heating is different from the one on cooling, and this is done by magnetic field. And I, I could explain, but anyway, um, and and so you know the main so, so the, the the maximum efficiency you, you get is the so-called Carnot efficiency, one minus T min over T max, and um, at least at least the measurements and also the predictions <coughs> seem to indicate that, that you could get a high fraction of the Carnot efficiency if you had near zero hysteresis. And the main losses are hysteretic losses, yeah, yeah. So they, so that thing, that's the reversibility of the phase transformation directly ties into energy conversion applications because of that, yeah. Are there any other questions? Very small temperature rise and drop and convert into something electrical. Yeah. How? What would be efficient? How long would it last? Can we actually use this, for example, like a car and recover some of the braking energy when our brakes start to heat? Well, up? that would be different. I mean, that would be. Um, um, I, you know, you you actually don't need. I mean, well, you you potentially could use phase transformations for that. Actually, um, it's not something that. So that would be somehow you put on the brakes. And um, and that changes that, that that heats something up. It goes through the phase transformation. It becomes a strong magnet, and then you have some induction, which <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. But, uh, I was just thinking thinking of, of course, you can stuff. think this. You can think about. Uh, I mean, a lot of idea because it's a solid state method of energy conversion. You know, you can think in a completely different way from. You know, having the big black tank and all the all the all the heat exchangers and the pumps and the tubes and all this stuff, and you can think that you can. So, so there is there's need for very creative thinking on the somehow design of of energy conversion devices. Or and uh, perhaps you're right. You could do something with the braking of cars and magnetic fields and the heating and phase transformation. I hadn't thought of that, <coughs> but uh, quite possible. It's, it's something there. Yeah. I think that was an open application. So, a lot of students here. <laughs> so I think it's time to uh, wrap this up and uh, thank our speaker one last time.